Okay, hi everyone. Maybe I'll uh, get us started with a few housekeeping things. Uh, this workshop is actually the first uh, one of a series of workshops that we're offering this week on different skills for uh, making change happen. Um, so if you want to see the other workshops happening as part of this week of training, you can go onto our website that I'm pasting in the chat box. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to pass on to Amalyn and Danny from the Artivist Network to introduce themselves and introduce the session and take us through it. And again, thanks everyone for joining. All right. um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amalyn. I'm from the Artivist Network. Um, today, Danny and myself from the Artivist Network will be going through with you on different actions and a few different uh, scenarios that we want to um, put you guys through. And let's um, be a bit more fun and creative. Feel free to uh, ask us any questions, um, but we have a certain Q&A slots. So if you have any questions, please type it in the chat. Um, so yeah, let me first begin by introducing myself. My name is Amalyn. I work with the Artivist Network and I've been with the Artivist Network now for the past uh, seven years. Um, I'm based in Malaysia. However, I'm currently in Budapest. Um, I also have been working primarily with uh, local grassroots groups back in Malaysia. I, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> yeah, I've also been working with local grassroots groups back in Malaysia. I have more of a background in uh, climate finance. However, with the Artivist Network over the years, I have been more focused towards action and uh, lobbying and protests. Uh, primarily around the UN conference zone and also other big climate events around the world. Um, today, they're going to be talking to you about uh, different types of actions and different things uh, that we go through when we do these different actions. But before I talk more about our session, uh, I'd like to pass it over to Danny to introduce himself and tell us a little bit more as well about Artivist Network. Go ahead, Danny. Hi everyone, um, my name is Danny. Um, I'm obviously also working with the Artivist Network. Um, I'm, I live and I'm based in Budapest and it's very funny to have uh, Amelin in the same city because it's uh, rare that we're so close to each other. So this is a good day already. Um, yeah, I come from a background of like public art and mainly focusing on like street art and techniques where it's, are coming from this subculture and I'm interpreting these kinds of techniques into kind of training materials and trying to support the movement with different kind of skill sets. Um, yeah, basically, I think that's it about me. I think I, I joined around uh, eight years ago, uh, just a little bit early, earlier than Amelin. And yes, today we're going to, we're going to have a, uh, like the first part of the, the training is going to be about um, like inspiring actions which we have done and which our allies have done over the last years, which are in different kinds of uh, contexts and different kinds of surroundings, different parts of the world. And um, after that, we're going to to play a little game together. Uh, Amanda, would you like to introduce the game? Yeah, so after Danny talks to you guys and um, goes through with you all on a few different uh, creative actions and techniques and uh, skills that we hope to pass along, um, we're going to go through a little um, game in a sense of a, put you guys through an action, put you guys through a real life scenario that could or may happen and see how you guys react. Um, I don't want to give too much away right now. Uh, we'll explain a little bit more later. Um, but before uh, we jump into Danny's uh, session, just want to tell you guys a little bit about Artivist Network. I just realized we didn't say much about Artivist Network yet. Um, the Artivist Network, we are a group of artists, activists, or artivists as we like to call it, um, from a lot of different backgrounds. And we help other organizations with um, their creative needs. Because a lot of times, I'm sure a lot of you out here know, at the end of the day, the creative side of um, protests and actions usually are towards the end. Um, we try to help bring that, pro that uh, creative process from the beginning of a campaign uh, planning and action planning 
um, so that you can get more media attention, you can get things more holistically done, and also to um, bring about um, where you're from and your culture through what you're doing uh, in protest or actions or lobbying. Um, you can find out more information about Artivist Network by checking out our cool new website, artivistnetwork.org. Um, but yeah, without further ado, I pass it back to Danny to start our session for today. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So, yeah, um, basically, I would just like to start with a little bit of a background story about us as the network and how it was, uh, how it was kind of funded. So the Artivist Network is, as Amelon said, a mixture of uh, artists, facilitators, and people on, in between the spectrum. And what we're trying to do is basically create the bridge between artists and activists. And basically, there are so many activists who are extremely keen on organizing many actions, but lack, lack this kind of creative aspect. And then there are so many artists who are amazing at creating art, but really feel that they would like to to kind of find a new way to be able to support something which is important and especially the climate movement is something where this has become very visible and more and more people are trying to support it um so yeah basically the artivist network um kind of started off as one of these social spaces as basically a networking space for people to come prepare for their actions and create learn new skills um this was uh, originally kind of started for us at, um, at kind of the, the UN, UN climate conferences and then carried on to different kinds of climate camps, uh, various mobilizations all over the world. And as, we're, as the years are passing, we're trying to uh, develop different kinds, of, uh, different kinds of methods to integrate creativity. But the art space was kind of our essential, essential space to, to work in. So, yeah, and basically this is where the movement can come together, can create, can get to know each other, and is also kind of this uh, community space for people to prep, to have meetings, to, yeah, basically it's just uh, loads of people go come to these spaces which we organize depending on what kind of context it is, which kind of uh, country or city or mobilization. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about myself and how I got kind of how I got connected to artivism and understood the words artivism. Um, I started painting walls um, roughly a bit, a bit more than 10 years ago. And I started to just knock on people's, uh, knock on people's doors in Budapest and ask them if I can paint their wall. Like this is more in the time when street art and graffiti was less, uh, less accepted as an art form. Now it's obviously become a huge, huge movement and very recognized uh, art form. Thank you, internet. So yeah, basically my story comes from like how, how art can win over a very funny argument with, uh, with an advertising company. So I knocked on the door of this uh, old couple and they gave me permission to paint their wall. And I was like, I was like 14 and I didn't have a lot of money. So kind of making a huge painting like this is a, uh, it was very difficult. I was going out like every day, but just with a little bit of paint, which I was able to find or kind of, you know, which I was able to buy. And anyway, as we were finishing, um, suddenly this advertising company decided to put two billboards onto the wall, which uh, made us extremely sad. And across from this wall, there's a huge mall. This is in the outskirts of, of Budapest. And yeah, I basically just, I was just so sad and you know i asked the i asked the people who lived there that um so how come there's a billboard and like why didn't you tell me about it and they said oh well they just like knocked uh like one week ago and they offered us money in exchange for the advertising space and like we we can't really say no to extra money so obviously i have to understand and a few weeks later i was passing by and realized that uh they actually had removed the billboards and I knocked again on the old couple's door and asked them, so what happened? And they said that the local council turned up and actually said that this company was not allowed to advertise here. And they had the billboards removed, but also gave the company a huge fine because, uh, because of the legal advertising. And they left a name card there for, me to, for us to get in touch and to kind of start working together, which was a really kind of a really important moment because this was kind of 
in the time where it was very unusual for like local councils or or governments or any kind of like bureaucratic system to kind of work together with anybody who's doing street art. So after that, basically we met and we we talked about how we could um, kind of improve public space, how we can like bring more art into into the into just like general life of people. And after this, with this uh, specific uh, district, we completed loads of murals. And like for example, this is on the school, and it was painted in 2015 before COP 20. One in Paris. This is before the Paris Agreement, and basically, street art has been such a good tool for us to be able to one like um, bring more color to people's lives, but also start a conversation about why this art is being created and what your message is, because people really want to understand, and it's very easy to mobilize um, mobilize kind of like like discussions and also to invite like local media and to tell them about what your message is. And so after this, we started to paint murals uh, everywhere, like when there's the, the COP. Also, this is in Poland during COP24, I think. I'm forgetting, sorry. Um, this is in Madrid. Um, and after this, I started to develop a, a skill set and a toolkit for people to also be able to create on a large scale without, uh, without actually having the artistic skills which someone would have. So street art is really based on kind of tricks. And all of these tricks are coming from um, ways to paint fast and efficiently, and also kind of kind of create something create something visually visually beautiful um, in a relatively large or relatively fast pace of time. So I started organizing this uh, street art basics workshop where people are learning their their various types of um, techniques to create large visual art for different mobilizations or for campaigns or for mural projects and also trying to teach a little bit of graphic design to people but everything is everything which i have developed is basically through like these like um open source free platforms so that it's accessible to everyone and that it's not um and that it's not alienating to anybody who is scared to draw something because basically nothing which is being made during these workshops is made by free hands it's uh, everything is with the tricks, as I said. Um, also, 350 already has a pretty nice toolkit from us, which uh, contains all of these techniques, together with some other amazing things which were made by Amlin and Malike. Um, yeah, we have used this technique to mobilize for end the that work together with Greenpeace to um, create different kinds of uh, visuals, uh, climate camps. And yeah, basically, I, this is what I've been doing as one of my main um, workshops and main trainings. Um, this is a picture of our prime minister with a lot of money. Um, and now I would like to talk a little bit about uh, tools for action and the inflatable cobblestone. Um, Arthur van Baan is a half Hungarian, half Dutch um, inflatable artist who first started to, to develop the inflatable cobblestone um, during the COP21 in Paris. and we started working together and um, he taught us how to build these cubes, which then we organized massive training on, um, mobilizing for Enda Galanda in 2016. And we loads of people gathered in Paris and this tool has been something very exciting. Uh, so we held this training for, for people from roughly six countries and everybody was there and learned how to make this, make this um, make this inflatable and then went back to their own country and they each made like 30, 40, 50 inflatable cubes, which then we all took to Germany. And we went there to, to block, to symbolically block um, a coal mine. So the funny story on this is that it has been useful for many different countries and different contexts. Here, this is people build, like building a blockade um, for the police cars which are coming to, to stop the protesters who are occupying the coal mine. But this picture is taken in Spain, where basically police violence is very general during a protest, and also people like um, people, the police filming people, filming the protesters with a, like through a helicopter. And this cube was became called the Reflecto Cube. And this tool, basically, because the sun shines on it, it blinds the cameras, but also creates this kind of playful, this playful moment between the police and protesters. So. It becomes this beach ball scenario, and and there's a video where the police in Spain they basically start to hit this inflatable and 
make a total joke out of themselves and then they arrested the cube and put it into a police van. But the beauty of the story is, is that nobody in the protest got hurt because the police were focusing on these cubes and everybody managed to escape from police violence. And as a mobilizational tool, this, uh, this action happened in Dortmund, where Dortmund is in Germany, where there is a massive neo-Nazi parade every year. And Arthur worked together with a few universities there, and they were building all of these cubes. But here they put on this mirror foil, and basically they surrounded the neo-Nazi parade, and people had to face their own reflection because of the mirror foil on the surface of the cube. And this way, symbolically, they had to face themselves, but also as they started to fight against these cubes, they are actually fighting themselves. So this has been a kind of a useful and very strong symbolic tool for many different, uh, many different movements over the years. And this is one of, my, uh, one of my favorite tools because you can use it for so many different things. And it's basically, this fits into a small backpack one of these, so it is very easily transportable and then suddenly becomes this huge cube. So it's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, and coming from this, where this is a very well designed object, I would like to talk a little bit about like everyday objects used in protest, which then can create symbols. This is the, the basically these rubber ducks were used in Thailand against the water cannons. And uh, yeah, basically it became a symbol, but also um, basically, it's used as a, it can't be defined as a passive weapon, because usually this is what makes everything very difficult during the protest, is that if you have a flag with you with a stick, they can, in some countries' context, they can already arrest you. And because of this, people are constantly looking for items which they can use as kind of self-protection and de-escalation. And sometimes it's just these everyday tools, similarly to the, to the umbrella movement in Hong Kong. and. Yeah, it's uh, something beautiful, and basically, it was also um, creates uh, like something very powerful visually. And as you can see in the previous picture and on this picture as well, people are writing their own messaging onto the onto the umbrellas. And for example, this is fossil free culture. I will talk a bit more about them, but they're also using these everyday objects in their actions, which uh, are very easily transportable, and you're able to just um, basically, you know. You have an umbrella, and then suddenly, if you're well organized, then you're able to create a massive, massive banner. Um, carrying on to movement, song, and choreography. This is a, many of you might know this. This is the song called A Rapist in Your Path, which was developed by the Chilean feminist movement, which became the, the world's biggest, uh, like most widely used. Um, feminist feminist song and choreography all over the world. As I know, it was I don't even want to say the number, but it has been massive. I'm sure that all of you have seen seen uh, seen this um, seen this beautiful song being done in protest. It's uh, extremely powerful, and also it's very easy to learn it because you can find so much information about it on the internet. Um, yes, and this is also I previously sh showed uh, fossil free culture. And this is one of their actions. Basically, fossil free culture's mission is to, to, to basically pressure cultural institutions to not accept any funding from fossil fuel companies. And they managed to they managed to basically make the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam um, resign their resign their contract with Shell to not accept any more um, any more funding from them. And then similarly also with BP, it's uh, very amazing in there. Basically their creativity is something very, very beautiful. Like the way they're organizing choreographies. Also this one is in the Van Gogh Museum as well. And everything is just made from this like very simple objects. And it's very easy to also just kind of take it into these institutions. This is also them there. It's called Drop the Shell, this action. And the people were drinking this, uh, from the shells, they were drinking this black liquid, which looked like oil, and they were spilling it all over themselves. It was a, it's an extremely safe, but at the same time, extremely powerful action, because there's not really anything they can do with you if you're doing something so peacefully. This is why creativity is so crucial in different kinds of actions. 
Um, and this is done by the Collective 23 in Paris. And the actual itself was interpreted by a performance artist from France. Um, basically, this is a anti-colonist feminist action where they're basically protesting protesting so many things it's basically it's, it was a very complex action but the person itself is a very known performance artist and all of it is basically kind of this fight fight against this colonial leader which you can see as the statue and that the man itself is basically held on pedestal by four women and this uh yeah this action was basically covered up by 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 like hundreds of police almost because it was happening during a during a protest and they were really trying to stop everyone from filming it but it still became an extremely powerful and beautiful action they're doing many different things and i really recommend you to have a look at collective 23 they're really really amazing and now i'd like to talk about something which is a, a bit more media focused but one of our ongoing projects and it's actually very exciting for us is guerrilla projections and we are now collaborating with Gastivists on, on this project where at the moment we are organizing guerrilla projection trainings and then groups are doing their actions uh, in their own countries. And now we are doing the actions in seven countries, if I'm correct. Yes, seven countries. And this is in Budapest. This was the first time we did our training. And yeah, basically we have this huge projector which Gastivists was kind enough to loan to us. And we're trying to uh, integrate different kinds of uh, different kinds of art and also a different kind of ways to send messages and different kind of ways to kind of hack um, important buildings or ways to send messages. So basically, like for example, this image is in Budapest, and in the background is the parliament. And at the moment, with the Russian-Ukrainian um, conflict, Hungary has been um, extremely unsupportive. Of, uh, of basically people who have been invaded by Russia. And this way of targeting, targeting, um, targeting their decision making with a peaceful protest, but also very safe protest, because um, the, worst case, the worst thing which can kind of happen to you is that they tell you to stop, stop projecting. So because of this, it's a, very, it's a very safe action, but also something which mainly focuses on online media platforms, because we got massive media outreach just because of actually using different hashtags which are more connected towards tourism because of the parliament because of hungary and then obviously all of the all of the different messages we used um against the fossil industry and gas industry um this is this was done in germany last week um pictures i have shown you were from budapest from poland and yeah, this is in Langsburger. They're going to build a um, offshore offshore terminal, energy terminal. And yes, basically, it has been something which is very exciting for us because we're trying to involve different visual artists, also creating graphics for us, um, working more on projection mapping, and also creating like animations to make our actions more powerful. Um, if you go on our website, you'll be able to find some cool videos of, of all of the actions we're doing. Um, Yes, and it is something where at the moment this projector is constantly on the road. It's a huge projector and it's a huge battery, so it's very exciting actually for us. And yeah, yeah, you can find out more on the website. And I would like to now talk a little bit about the wheat pasting and randomism as a technique. Um, this is something which is very connected to street art, but also I would like to focus um, a little bit on the different different aspects on how this has been done. So this picture is, um, is basically in 2015 when we had, the, we had uh, millions of people uh, coming to Hungary from Syria and Afghanistan. And basically the Hungarian government um, wasn't reactive and didn't actually support anyone, but they created this massive hatred campaign, which for example, here it says that if you come to Hungary, you need to obey, you need to respect our culture. And under it, it says the national consultation of immigration and terrorism. So it became a absolutely disgusting hate campaign. And these, post these posters or these billboards were turning up everywhere. Basically, they, they bought tons and tons of these and it was just everywhere in your face. So there's this, um, 
fake political party, which was then fake, now it's actually a real political party called um, the Tuesday Dog Party. And they started an online campaign. And basically, they copied the exact same font, the exact same coloring, and um, started to create this anti campaign where basically it just says, You entered from Austria to Hungary, and the first billboard which greeted you was sorry about our prime minister. And it was just uh, absolutely amazing because the, the whole fundraiser became so massive and everybody started to kind of um, chip in and um, support this campaign. And you were able to send in your own uh, slogan and then they would buy a billboard and put, their, put your slogan on it. So it became something absolutely hilarious. And similarly, this is arguably a different kind of vandalism. But I wanted to use this as an example because it's something very funny. Um, every year we have all of our rules renovated because of the, the companies who are doing it. They're using the worst quality of materials because this way every year they're able to redo the rules and you know get more money from it every year. And every all of these companies are close to our government. So the Tutia Dog Party basically, when they get campaigning money then they always turn turn their funding into some sort of social project. So this was basically here, you are not able to get fined for doing this because um, like basically they are, you know, shining the light on this corruption, um, corruption case. But at the same time, this counts as um, basically um, drawing people's attention to a safety hazard. So because of this, there is no fine involved. And if you're walking here in the city, then loads of the places are just covered with the same paint. And you could go to the, the, their office and basically they would just give you paint for free. And then you could go and paint your cracks. And it was very funny because like basically it was even in the end, like, like so many students and so many like little children from schools were painting, painting these cracks. And there's nothing you can actually do. But it has been one of the most powerful kind of visual campaigns which they have done. Um, Yes, this is done by Emilio Colectivo in Spain. And this is one of the, the colonialist uh, statues. And on the stairs, they, they um, wheat pasted um, people who are getting deported from Spain or who have been um, killed by police violence. And their actions are very, very powerful. And they're, yeah, they're really amazing. Um, this is also them. And this is uh, during the Spanish bubble where People who lost their homes went to the walls of the banks and we pasted their own portraits or their own faces onto, onto the banks. And it's an extremely powerful and beautiful action. Um, this one is done in 2015 by the Brandalism team. They're, um, English, they're an English um, collective who really focus on actually like changing, changing bus stop ads and changing billboards but without permission so they they are just going around and this is in paris where they printed hundreds of these and they over the over one day they managed to change really like i think 300 billboards with different kinds of um different kinds of messaging and yeah for example this is when we talk about like actual like real ad vandalizing this is uh, during the Volkswagen scandal that sorry we're sorry that we got caught it's not that we're sorry that we totally lied about our car being much more uh, environmentally friendly. So they're working a lot with open cost towards artists and inviting people to, to basically share their graphic design with them. And then they do the printing and then during different kind of mobilizations, they organize uh, these teams to go out and change the, change the bus stop ads. And actually there's a very funny story with this, uh, with this because in Paris when we were, when we, they were doing this action, then you know everybody is wearing these um, safety vests or you know these uh, trans this um, these green vests where you know people are working for Jesse the Co. And there was these people like you can order the key for this through like eBay, and they were really struggling to open it. And somebody from the company was walking there and was like, "Oh hey, oh no, they messed up our schedules. I was supposed to do this one." And they're like, "Ah," and you know like really awkward and the person was like, ah, oh, you're struggling, wait, let me show you. And like the person actually showed them how to open it up, how to change it, how to put it back. And uh, yeah, basically it was just like, it's just extremely funny that like uh, 
people don't realize you're actually doing an action unless you're visible. And because of this, like, you always need to be a ninja and, you know, you're always kind of, you know, you make, you make yourself look like you're actually supposed to be doing what you're doing. Um, this is uh, the Defunct Climate Chaos Project by the Gastivist, where they covered the, the, the windows of banks over the weekend with um, basically like different places which, have, which are suffering from, from climate and from all of like the climate impacts. And yes, it's just a beautiful action which I wanted to share with you. And yeah, I very quickly wanted to rush you through all of these uh, different kinds of amazing techniques. And I really hope that I managed to inspire you because I hope that you will be able to use it in our next exercise. And if anybody has any questions, then please feel free to speak. Hello. Um, yes, the presentation will be available after this training. Um, we're going to do a quick, um, not a quick, we're going to do one round of Q&A now for 15 minutes. So if anyone has any questions, um, either raise your hand uh, or put a star in the chat and we'll get to you. Um, so yeah, we'll just do about a 15 minute round of Q&A. So does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? Uh, anything about the techniques or about the actions that Danny uh, ran with us? Anybody? I can come yeah. in. Go ahead. I mean, thank you so much. That was so incredibly cool, super inspiring. Um, and it just like, it sparks a lot of ideas. So I, I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I. I don't know if it's a question, it's more of a comment, but I think uh, the security situation is different in different countries. So it's something to think about. But I do wonder if um, if you've thought about that and, and about risk when it comes to creative action and you know any mitigation strategies. Uh, I know it's not straightforward in, in, in Europe either, uh, especially in, in the more authoritarian context, but yeah, would, would love to hear any thoughts that you've had or experiences in, in more authoritarian or less secure or less free context. Yeah, sure thing. Um, Danny, do you want to answer this first and then I can add on as well? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, well, yeah, this is uh, exactly, it's very difficult. Basically, a lot of the, the examples I have shown are actually from Western Europe. And for example, wouldn't be successful even in Hungary where I am and probably also not wouldn't work, for example, in Amelin's context in Malaysia. So, uh, but he can talk a bit more about that. I think that there is um, there is like some things where like some techniques which are very kind of um, powerful to use when you know basically if you're not allowed to protest or if uh, kind of the reaction from authorities is immediate and very violent. It's like, for example, we had this like the government sent out this referendum about um, about this like basically like everybody like do you agree with like immigrants coming and taking over your culture and this is like. It was such a stupid campaign, but um, at that time they were basically using everything, saying that like because there is like um, terrorists, there's like the danger of terrorist attacks. You're not allowed to protest. You're not allowed to be out on the streets. You're not allowed to gather. And basically, people just, for example, made they folded airplanes out of the questionnaire, and everybody went to the parliament and threw their paper airplane at the parliament. And that is like kind of I think maybe something which is kind of very symbolical, very powerful, but also kind of easy to maybe get away with but maybe amelin could like i just wanted to bring one example which came to my mind amelin do you have something which you would like to share yeah um so what you mentioned Bisan, uh it's it, it's um very true for a lot of the things we do as well um in different countries uh, like i'm from malaysia where it depends on who is in power on how radical you can go and be on the street um, like for us, if you want to do protests, we need to notify the police ahead of time or things like this. Um, in Indonesia, for example, foreigners can't protest, but as an Indonesian, you can do whatever you want. Police can't stop you. Um, so security situations definitely change and differ according to different countries. Um, and I think it's really about applying what you want and how in like the different contexts. For example, like with the billboards and the signage, um, that was a really smart and interesting way to do something without having to gather people physically in locations. And it was um, like doing these billboards and vandalism, for example, is 
one way you don't necessarily need a lot of people to create a visual but the visual is in a high visibility place or something like this which helps propagate your message and also um, when it comes to things like this do remember that what you're seeing for example now that Danny has been showing there's a lot of other aspects to those protests to those campaigns the online communication the Facebook um, social media push uh, the the different um, things you need to do to get your actions ready all these things also do um, matter and are important as well so don't just uh, say like see it as that only the security side of things is a problem so we're just not going to protest we're not going to do anything there are workarounds and like i always like to recommend um, groups that we work with to always talk to someone from your local bar council or like local lawyers associations they are more than willing to tell people about what you can do and can't do um, and also it's sometimes about being creative. Uh, in the UN, you aren't allowed to simply carry around signs and things. You need to get them approved if you want to do an action in um, the COP, for example. But there's a workaround. What people do is they wear the slogan. So they make a shirt with the slogan or their campaign hashtag. And you can't tell me I can't wear my shirt. This is my traditional attire with my shirt saying this and that. Um, and these are like workarounds, like you can put stickers on your laptop um, with your campaign and everything and go and stand in front of the cameras um, and you get a little bit of attention in that direction. So, yeah, it's about being a bit more creative. And I think um, for most Asian countries and non-Western countries generally, um, Global South countries, we have a lot more stricter um, uh, police presence, not always, uh, but some, in, in most in general, but um, there's always a workaround and there are some really creative things that can be done. Um, yeah, I hope that answers uh, your question. Um, anyone else with any questions uh, before we move on to our next round? Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, my comment is also, I, I want to comment uh, something which is more aligned to what uh, Bisani is, is, is asked before. Uh, I feel like the, the political climate uh, in, your, in, in, in the Western and the, in the European side, I think uh, it's more flexible as compared to the, the African context. I'm from Zimbabwe and, uh, you know, this activism, uh, especially in the south southern african part you know they can be uh uh they can be viewed as catalysts for regime change so uh my question is uh how how best can we uh is in is there is there any successful uh a uh, 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 campaign that you have done in africa that can also uh be a testimony to other countries like my country in Zimbabwe? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very important question. And I think very important comments also. Um, but I like personally, what I think is that in kind of um, in contexts where, where many kinds of actions which do work in Western contexts are not doable, like this is, for example, where I think that like arts as a tool for community organizing can be extremely important. And for example, painting murals, I have heard them. I saw that Christian is here from 350. So for example, they were painting murals together and basically using kind of art as like, you know, kind of a community tool and for people to, you know, basically network and to meet each other and to form a, a bigger kind of trust and community around climate. So. I think that even in like, you know, the kind of thing about public art and street art is that if you're not directly using anti-governmental wording, you're still able to send an extremely important message to the public. So as I understood from like our previous conversations, for example, with, uh, with uh, from last year, then for example, like kind of public art and street art is kind of a technique which could work pretty well there. But if anybody, like if there's anyone here in the room who, has a good example, then please feel free to, to raise your hand and tell us about uh, 
your experience or the successful campaign. I, Amnon, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah. So uh, that's a really good question, Bothwell. Um, it really depends on the political situation as well. But like you just said, um, in Zimbabwe and in South Africa, in Southern Africa and different African countries as well, there's a lot of um, movements that have taken down uh, regimes um, that have changed governments um, because of the power of the people. And yeah, like Daniel is also mentioning, um, uh, Christian who's here. I'm hoping he will share with us a little bit of the examples that they've done um, in uh, the different uh, countries in Africa. Um, but like some of the things that they have done as well have had amazing power in unifying and spreading the message to the people as well. And this is one thing that we, I would say in the global south, um, have an abundance of is our culture, our um, different uh, roots in the ground in that sense uh, that maybe the western side doesn't have as much um, compared to uh, what we in uh, the global south have like here in Indonesia in Malaysia we use our culture and uh, the art behind it the techniques like shadow puppetry and things like this to highlight and bring about messages and this becomes easier for people to relate to because it's relatable, that it's their culture, it's something like colors that they're common to see or like messaging and wording that is similar to what they hear in everyday life. So yeah, these kind of things are very important as well. And they are like an, like an amazing tool art can be used as not just to push out your message to the big media, but also can be used to communicate what you want to the people around you that you need the support from. Um, and also just as a little comment as uh, to Bothwell's comment, um, sometimes some of these movements, you can radicalize them in different directions. In Malaysia, we had uh, an artist, um, his name is Fahmi Reza. He drew a caricature of our ex-prime minister who stole our money, the Malaysian people's money. And because of this caricature, they we managed to mobilize our whole country, everyone to topple down this prime minister, change him through elections. And actually four days ago, he was just put into jail. And that is a huge victory that all came about because one artist um, decided enough was enough. And I'm going to start making fun of this guy. Um, and yeah, it can really make a powerful impact uh, with what you do. But yeah, Christian, is it okay if we ask you to share a little bit um, of uh, an example of something uh, that you guys have done recently? Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, my question is uh, that uh, how much are you thinking about like uh, eco-friendly mediums, like uh, mediums, for example, like a uh, mm, non-plastic or like uh, like a solar panel energy those kind of like things for example in japan when we make some like a banners in japan we try not to use a plastics because it's not eco-friendly <laughs> and also when we do some like led actions we, we try to use uh solar panel energy because it's eco-friendly so how much are you consider it about it because sometimes it's too expensive it's sometimes so you know hard to you know prepare for it so yeah if you have some kind of like guidelines or like uh ideas that's going to be great I think mean, this is such a huge uh, issue for all of us, I think, who are working in like uh, anything creative is that you try to not cause more harm by doing something. Um, I think that it's very difficult for us also because we are constantly working in a different countries' context. So it's kind of, you know, we, we're like, we do something in, in one country and then next month it's in a different country. And there is like only so many things that you can take with yourself. So it's like, you know, just to not have to buy new. Um, I think that there's great examples of um, people using kind of recycled plastic to to create, for example, these like uh, like light, like the light banners or not light banners, but like creating basically like installations from recycled plastic. And I don't know, it's uh, something where we are all struggling to, to, um, to be as friendly as we can to to the environment but yeah like your examples are basically the best ones i have as well because we're constantly struggling with this and i think the best we can do is that you know we try to reuse what we already make 
and then you know at least like just you know repaint a banner or something and it's a very difficult like i don't have a, an answer to to this sadly i mean we are all just uh, struggling to make it work somehow because you're as you said it's like sometimes like the environmentally friendly one is unaffordable so it's uh it's very difficult but yeah if anybody has any good ideas on this please share <laughs> because we i think we all need the we all need ideas Yeah, and also just to add, like, uh, Tanaka, what you guys mentioned and, like, how you guys are doing things, this is, like, a very positive way of uh, handling things as well. Not everyone does this. Um, and, like, definitely uh, commend you guys for pushing and pursuing this because, like, even for us, like Danny said, when we go to different places and do things, sometimes we have to buy new equipment or new um, items or things like this. But at the end of the day, like, it also depends on perspective and how you view these things. Like um, if you're going to be do, doing something, make sure it's worth it. If you're gonna be making a plastic um, puppet or something, make sure you get the most out of it. Don't just like do it once and throw it away. Um, use that plastic well, you know? Um, I don't know if you guys have this in Japan, um, but like for example, in Malaysia, when you get a plastic bag from the store, which you now have to buy, um, no one throws away a plastic bag after one use everyone like stores it away ends up using it more and more for like different different things so in a way you can try and look at what you're doing with your activism as well don't just uh, use it once and it's done um, if you have like extra banners or extra flyers that you guys made you can always take that and use it for something else or use it as materials for a uh, different build or something like this so don't always say no because it's like not environmentally friendly, but also just think about if you're going to do it, if you're going to bite the bullet, make sure it's the most uh, effective um, that you can. I hope that answers the question as well. And like, like Danny said, we definitely are not the best at uh, doing this. And if anyone has suggestions and stuff on how we can be more um, environmentally conscious as artists and activists, we are more than welcome to hear anything. I saw Christian, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, Amlen. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. I'm facing some internet issues here. So, uh, thank you. About your previous question uh, on our experience in, in Africa as the, uh, yeah, uh, uh, the guy from Zimbabwe said, it is, it is not easy. Uh, I'm mobilizing uh, in Africa. It is not easy. Uh, it is very, uh, difficult, but we started something with uh, some of our group in in Africa, in West Africa, uh, around our solution work on renewable energy uh, by using banners uh, and uh, with uh, our groups in DSC. And uh, I'm very happy to have some of the organizer on the ground from DSC here on this uh, training on this session. So I would like to maybe to invite them to, to share uh, what we are doing around uh, fossil free Virunga in DSC in Goma. We have Pascal, we have Francois, uh, both of them are from DSC, from Goma. Uh, but uh, if you, you allow that we speak French and uh, to share, because it is, it is uh, most better to hear from uh, the, the, the organizer on the ground who are yeah taking action? So if we we all are agree, we, I can invite Pascal, and you guys can take the translation in English, and so Pascal can share what they are doing in DSC, uh, especially in Goma, uh, around fossil free Virunga, uh, yeah. And I will uh, I will search some link from what what we did with them and share here. Uh, from link we we posted on Twitter. I will search and and share send with you. So Pascal, are you able to to share what you are doing around public art in Goma, Pascal? In French, you can go. Tu peux parler français, Pascal? Il y a la traduction. Pascal or François or Justin. Merci beaucoup. Je suis Justin Mutabesha 
de l'AJVDC, nous agissons euh, très activement avec 350.org dans la ville de Goma, euh, dans un contexte très compliqué, dans un contexte de guerre. Aujourd'hui même, il y a un tas de sièges où c'est les militaires qui dirigent la province. Euh, depuis juin, le 30 juin 2021, jusqu'à nos jours, euh, nous agissons dans la campagne Fossil Free Virunga. Fossil Free Virunga, c'est une campagne de 350 org. Euh, nous, nous menons des actions de terrain, euh, des manifestations. Euh, en tout cas, nous protestons contre l'exploitation du pétrole dans les parcs de Virunga. Comme vous le savez tous, les parcs de Virunga, c'est un patrimoine mondial qui est sous menace de, des entreprises de fossiles comme Total, Soko et Ephora de l'Afrique du Sud. Ce sont des entreprises de fossiles qui menacent l'exploitation du pétrole dans les parcs de Virunga. À côté de ces entreprises de fossiles, nous avons aussi les, les, les œufs de l'air qui, qui exploitent les bois qui est pour les charbons, les charbons des bois, Ils sont tous des menaces sur les parcs de Virunga. Euh, en dépit de toutes ces menaces, nous, nous agissons toujours. Nous agissons. Euh, nous, nous menons. Des, des actions de terrain, par exemple, les manif des, des, des manifestations, je l'ai dit, aussi des œuvres d'art, des, des, des activités artistiques. Donc, nous avons peint les tableaux sur lesquels on peut lire nos à l'exploitation de Virunga. C'est un tableau qui se trouve sur les murs euh, non loin du gouvernorat provincial. Euh, euh, c'est au passage, c'est au passage de, des autorités provinciales. Ça, c'est une activité artistique qui cadre avec euh, la campagne Fossil Free Virunga. Mais aussi, nous, il y a d'autres actions d'exposition artistique que nous menons. Euh, nous organisons des spectacles dans des lieux publics où nous appelons les gens, nous mobilisons la population euh, à venir voir ces expositions artistiques. Euh, euh, tout cela dans le cadre de la campagne Fossil Free Virunga, à part le, 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 les expositions artistiques. Euh, ici, là, nous préparons un concert public qui va mobiliser des artistes et des, sla et des slameurs pour, dans le cadre de dénoncer les menaces qui pèsent sur les parcs nationaux de Virunga. Euh, aussi, Actuellement, nous agissons avec les journalistes. Nous sommes avec euh, un, des journalistes ici en ville de Goma. Euh, chaque lundi, ils nous invitent à la radio pour une émission de sensibilisation de la population. Et cela est écouté par les autorités politiques, mais aussi la population qui ne comprenait rien de, de, de la protection de l'environnement, qui ne comprend rien de, du changement climatique qui ne comprend rien de, de, de la campagne. Avec cette émission, nous essayons d'atteindre une grande, une, grande, une grande masse de la population, c'est-à-dire un grand public. Voilà tout ce que nous menons, nous faisons avec 350.org au niveau de Goma, qui est une ville de la RDC, mais aussi de partout à Kinshasa, nous travaillons avec des journalistes. Nous, nous, il y a des articles qui sont rédigés dans le cadre toujours de la campagne, à part le, le, les articles, il y a, il y a, il y a aussi, il y a aussi des, des, des conférences, des conférences dans des universités. Récemment, nous avons fait un grand tournant dans des écoles, dans des grandes écoles, universités de la ville de Goma, pour, pro, pour projeter un film, un documentaire que, que nous avions réalisé avec 350.org. Dans les films documentaires, nous sommes en train de dénoncer l'exploitation du pétrole dans les Virunga. Aussi, nous sommes en train d'appeler la population à comprendre la lutte. Aussi, nous interpellons les dirigeants congolais, par exemple, 
de retirer toutes les licences d'exploitation du pétrole qui sont données à toutes ces entreprises de fossiles, eh, Total, Soko et Ephora. Et nous sommes en train d'appeler les gouvernements congolais à investir beaucoup de forces dans les énergies renouvelables. Dans les énergies renouvelables. Parce qu'au-delà de dénoncer, nous proposons une solution d'investir de, de, dans les énergies renouvelables. Et aujourd'hui, le combat n'est pas si facile parce que la RDC venait de, de faire la vente euh, aux enchères de 27 blocs pétroliers. Nous, les activistes d'ici à Goma et de la RDC, nous ne sommes pas d'accord. Nous ne sommes pas d'accord avec cette décision du gouvernement. Nous allons, avec l'appui de 350, nous allons continuer à agir jusqu'à ce que euh, la, le gouvernement congolais revienne sur sa décision de donner au, de faire la vente aux achats des de blocs pétroliers. Voilà les, les actions que nous menons, comme je l'ai dit au départ. En RDC, le contexte est très compliqué. Il y a beaucoup de répression des dirigeants. En cas de manifestation, il y a des policiers qui sont déployés un peu partout dans les artères publiques et cela nous empêche de mener eh, des actions comme il faut. Malgré tout cela, nous essayons de, de, de percer les murs euh, et de mener une action. Voilà, si je peux finir par là pour ne pas prendre beaucoup de minutes. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup à tout le monde. Merci beaucoup aux organisateurs de cette formation. Euh, merci beaucoup à Christian et à 350.org. Merci beaucoup. Uh, so, uh, Thank you, Pascal. Uh, I, I found some link and uh, I share here with you guys. You can see oui, some just of just the just action just. they took previously in DSC. And uh, we uh, we are doing the same thing with uh, uh, some of our group in uh, West Africa around solution work. I will uh, I, uh, try to, to find some of the uh, link and also continue to share here. Thank you, Amlet. Thank you, Christian. And um, yeah, this is like, I think, um, Pascal, amazing work, what you guys are doing over there. This is a perfect example of groups that are really resilient and pushing forward no matter the circumstances. And yeah, definitely, the more creative you are with things, the more you can try different things with the cops as well, because if they are always used to the same thing, they also will know how to deal with you. But if you have new, exciting things, um, different things, they can't always uh react the same way um but yeah thank you so much for sharing that story um we are gonna go into a little game now uh we if you have any more questions don't don't worry you can uh save them for the end we will have one last q a before we end uh today's session in an hour um I just want to double check is everyone here able to talk and use their microphone because in our next session, we'll be breaking out into groups and it will be very necessary for everyone to speak. Yep, everyone's okay with using their mics. If you can't, you can also use your chats uh, in, the, in your groups, in the breakout rooms. Uh, so yeah, let's jump on into our next session. So before... Paul, Robert is continuously connecting to audio. Okay, there are a few people with some technical issues. If you do have any technical issues, um, just please notify the support. Or if you can't connect to the audio, um, just try with the chat if possible. So uh, first things first, I am making four breakout rooms here. Uh, I've assigned everyone to the first three. However, if anyone needs French translation, for French translation, please join room four. All right. You don't have to join, jump into the breakout rooms yet. I will uh, do an explanation for everybody, and then I will prompt you to jump into the breakout rooms. But for now, uh, please just, uh, if you need French translation, please choose room four in the breakout rooms. All right. Uh, everyone is back here, correct? 
everyone is here. Nope, I see some people have jumped into the breakout rooms. Uh, please give me one minute. Uh, let me jump into this room and call everybody out. So what we're going to be doing right now is we're going to be playing a little game. Uh, this game is commonly known as the River Roleplay game. I'm not so sure if some of you here have played this game before. Uh, if you have, um, play along. It's, it's fun to play it more than once as well. Uh, if you have not, uh, feel free to listen and we'll go through um, everything right now. So, uh, first things first, I've assigned you all into four different groups, um, with the French interpretation being group four and the rest in groups one, two, and three. So, you must be wondering. Uh, what are these groups and what's going to happen? So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be running through a scenario. Each and every one of you of your groups is going to be given a designation. So in this situation, we are not going to be doing a river uh, role play, but we will be doing a United Nations role play. So I will give you guys a situation uh, and each group has to react to this situation. However, each of your groups have something to do with each other. Everyone has a relationship with one another. Some of y'all might be NGOs. Some of y'all might be governments. Some of y'all might be um, media. Um, but we'll go through that uh, shortly. Once uh, you go through a scenario, you will then have about seven minutes to react to the scenario. After which, you will need to place your uh, response into an Excel sheet that I will paste the link here shortly. And then we will go through what each group has reacted to the scenario. We will do this three times for a total of four different scenarios. And um, at the end of it, we will discuss whether uh, is it a positive reaction or a negative reaction um, to, this, to this situation. I know it's a little vague right now, um, but is everyone clear on that for now? That you need to work together to react to different situations that are about to happen. Yes? Okay. So let me tell you all about uh, what we will be playing today. So I am, have divided groups into rooms one, two, three, and four. And each of these groups will be represented by, the first group will be the United Nations slash government. Room two will be policy NGOs. Room three will be grassroots groups. And room four will be journalists and media. Just remember this for now, and then I'll tell you guys what's gonna happen next. So, I'm going to tell you guys a situation, and each of your groups needs to react to this situation. It is one continuous situation, and every seven minutes is going to be represented by a time frame of eight hours. Okay, so the situation which we are going to be dealing with is that the United Nations, Group 1, uh, cancelled the Paris Agreement. So group one, um, which is the UN, uh, is going to cancel the Paris Agreement. So I want groups uh, two, three, and four, which is the policy NGOs, grassroots NGOs, and journalists to react to this situation. Because um, just as an explanation, policy NGOs um, would be more towards groups that have been following climate research um, groups like Climate Action Network that constantly follow what the different policies are happening in different uh, situations, and they might sometimes agree or disagree with the Paris Agreement. Grassroots NGOs are specifically that people who are on the ground, people who are affected by climate change uh, directly, and um, uh, people who are facing the impacts of climate change today. Um, and the fourth group is, I think, doesn't need much inter, uh, uh, explanation. It's those of you uh, who will be like the journalists, the media. What are you guys going to do about this? Are you going to hype it up, hush it down, change the context, uh, different things? So I will be giving you all 
a, a, a situation that happens every eight hours. But basically, um, the situation is that in 12 hours, uh, the UN cancels the Paris Agreement. Right now, it's an announcement, and in 12 hours, the UN cancels the Paris Agreement. You will have seven minutes to discuss uh, what the situation is and then react to that situation. Once you've reacted to it, we will discuss your reactions and then discuss what happens next. Is that okay with everybody? Does everyone understand this for now? It'll get much easier when we, once we start the game. Okay, I see everyone's all right. Um, here is the first question for everybody. And now I want you to join your breakout rooms, go into your breakout rooms and discuss this according to uh, who you are. You have seven minutes at which at the end of these seven minutes, I want you to paste your reactions into this Excel sheet that I pasted in the chat. Everyone should have access to this and please only put your reaction in your situation at the correct time. So the first situation is at 12 noon and each group will paste and write their reactions here. So the reaction which I'm expecting now is the, for the first situation, which is the UN pulls out of the Paris Agreement. How do you react? So thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll go back into another round of discussion shortly. But firstly, I just want to go through uh, the different groups uh, here. Um, you have, again, the UN, the government, the people who are actually making this decision right now, right here, um, of cancelling the Paris Agreement. Then you have the policy NGOs, uh, who are those, again, like groups like Third World Network, uh, Climate Action Network, people who follow the Paris Agreement and different climate policies around the world, uh, the grassroots groups, um, and then last but not least, the journalists. So does anyone maybe from uh, the UN government or from Group 1 want to just like explain what they, uh, how they are reacting to their own news? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to go if that's okay with Bothwell and, and Ari. So uh, I think a part of uh, our text got cut out, but basically the reason that the UN decided that we don't want to, uh, we want to cancel the Paris Agreement is that be is because it's toothless, it was too capitalist, um, Global North governments weren't being very serious about supporting climate action, and they weren't serious about um, supporting Global South governments and, and adaptation and mitigation efforts. Um, so in terms of, you know, that's kind of our narrative. And in terms of the, the protest action or the kind of like loud visual thing that we would do is we would just say, um, the UN has given up on climate change because no one's taking it very seriously. So we're just going to focus on, on immediate issues like, um, you know, COVID-19 and then just let the planet die because we're, we're, we're going there anyway. Um, yeah, and then uh, the other idea was to do something that demonstrates that the impact is felt, felt greater than in the, global south, in, in the global south and in the global north so to kind of draw that distinction on climate impact. All right, thank you from the government. Uh, Eri, you want to add on? No, I was just applauding. Ah, applauding, <laughs> sorry. Said. All right, um, okay, awesome. So we've heard from the UN, they've canceled the Paris Agreement because they think it's toothless. They think all the governments are useless. So they've given up on climate change. Remember this year, this will be important for later. Um, anyone from the policy NGOs want to tell us your reaction? Sure, I can summarize. Um, so we are being very proactive and just moving ahead regardless of the UN. Uh, and we're gonna bring like-minded countries together for a new legally binding agreement that's better than Paris, leaving out all the countries that would never have implemented Paris anyway, and right. instead bringing indigenous and marginalized communities directly to the decision-making table, even if their governments don't. 
uh, we will focus on actions instead of words, and we will also at the same time go about trying to reform the UN, make a new version of the UN. Of course, that will be easy. And we will focus on making the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty a great success instead of Paris. Okay, well, I like that too. Another group which is all about no to the UN, screw you guys, you're too slow, we'll do it ourselves. Love that. Um, anyone from the grassroots NGOs would like to tell us your response? Elizabeth or Nabulime? Okay, um, I'll go. So in the grassroots um, group, how we're reacting to this is that um, the, the Paris Agreement is a long-term plan that wasn't going to do anything for us right now and the impact of the climate crisis we already face it. The COVID-19 was a case in point for us. We were being told, wash our hands, wash our hands, but in the grassroots, most people don't even have access to water to eat, bathe, or even drink. So we don't have, they didn't have water to wash their hands. So we need a short-term plan. Why the UN and the policy groups and the government get themselves together for a long-term plan, which was what the Paris Agreement was all about. We're facing the impact right now. So for us, we're looking at the short-term plan of we need access to phones we need access to infrastructure infrastructure so we're not extinct we're not wiped out at the grassroots level before the policies that they are going to bring themselves together all the big boys and decide that all oh, this is what we're going to do in 2000 we need action now and for us that action is we need access to funds we need access to infrastructures why the work on the long-term plan so that's how we're reacting to it in the grassroots group i love it I love that you guys, instead of focusing on the big stuff, you guys are focusing on what's on the ground. And that's very important um, because at the end of the day, what all these big policies and everything are talking about is always about things that are gonna happen in the future and not necessarily right now. Um, that's amazing, I love that. Um, anyone from the media team? Uh, I know the media team only had a couple of people, or one person, um, but anyone from the media team from the French group would like to say, tell us what you guys are going to react to, or how you guys are going to react, sorry? Uh, okay, it's all right. Um, we can hear back from them a little later. Um, then this is the situation right now. Based on what all of y'all have said, there is no in the UN, even from within the UN. Um, there is no um, faith in the Paris Agreement doing anything in uh, this year or the X amount of years to come. And a lot of y'all want to focus on doing things yourself. Okay? This is the current situation and context. So I'm going to give you one more session, like one more scenario like this again, following the same thing that you guys just talked about. And this is the last one, then we'll end. Um, and this will be a bit more quicker, just five minutes uh, for you all to quickly discuss the reaction to um, what I'm about to say. Okay, is everyone ready? All right. So after all of you all have come back and said that there's no faith in the United Nations to handle climate change, Shell, the Dutch Oil and Gas Corporation, Shell, has now been appointed of worldwide, worldwide climate change relief. Shell is now in charge of the UNFCCC. Okay, I repeat that. Since all groups have no faith in the United Nations to handle climate change, Shell the oil and gas company Shell is now in charge of worldwide climate change relief. Basically, Shell is now in charge of UNFCCC. Okay, I'm gonna open the rooms. Uh, you can join, go and join back the same groups again. Quickly have this discussion and then come back here. Yeah, okay, I see everyone's here. 
So this is interesting. I like some of the discussions I was hearing uh, in some of the rooms. Uh, some were willing to bite the bullet, say we need to just believe in Shell. Uh, some were very aggressive to get Shell. Um, I can understand that. I didn't like this company to terrible people. Um, but anyways, let's see what you guys have to say. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... From our discussion, we, we, we realized that we, we as the UN, we should, move, we, we should put too much pressure on Shell. Number one, we should uh, uh, promote uh, hard sanctions on Shell so that we, we disengage their operations in, 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 in their area of, 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 of work. And then uh, we, we also, uh, made sure that we, 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 we sanction each and every country that is going to accommodate Shell so that we creep its op operations again. And then we also discussed um, that we should also uh, promote individuals that are, are advocating for green energy, the likes of Elon Musk, so that we can have a little bit of competition with Shell. So, uh, and we also uh, uh, promoted a heavy tech system on Shell so that we do not want uh, 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 its presence to, to, to contaminate our planet. Uh, that, 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 I don't know if I left uh, anything else from our, from our group. Just one more thing <clears throat> that uh, we capture the money that you know, Shell made uh, profits out of, you know, Making this catastrophe climate crisis, and then give it, uh, give it, give the money to the new uh, secretary out of UNF Triple C. The um, the first NGOs just you know uh, advocated and just made made. So yeah, that's it. Awesome. Okay, so the I like this idea. The 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 old UN basically is saying that they're gonna destroy and take over Shell, take all their money, and sanction them and give all the power to um, the policy uh, folks who I have said in before that they wanna recreate our UN to be more better and uh, more efficient and actually successful. Um, policy NGOs, do you guys have anything to say? I see your answer is kind of completely opposite from the UN uh, answer. Uh, anyone from the second group want to uh, share quickly? So yeah, we, we thought about doing a big angry reaction to this and boycotting the UNFCCC and just encouraging all the countries not to show up uh, because it would be run by Shell. But then we thought, well, maybe what if we flip this whole thing on its head and we embrace this whole decision and we make them pay to fix all the problems that they've caused and we hold them accountable by installing a governing body over the top of them. Um, and they also have to bring on BP, Total, Exxon, Chevron, um, and all together they're charged with the task of fixing the climate crisis that they're largely responsible for with a time frame. And if they fail, they go to jail. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, anyone else from the third group would like to tell us what the um, civil societies are feeling or the grassroots groups are feeling? Anyone from group three? Um, okay, I'll go again. Um, so we're still leading very much with, um, with our first stand, but this time around we'll also be working um, very closely with the policy groups. So in the communities where there's oil companies, where all of these people have their have their facilities where they are benefiting from. We're going to ensure that they are paying tax, that they are that they're impacting their community, and not just short term but also long term plan. Which is why we're working with the policy groups to ensure that all of these people come together, and they are actively making sure that the communities are benefit benefiting from it. So, but short term, but long term, everything is in place. We don't want promises, we want actions. So we're ensuring that all of these things are going to happen. And then like the policy group say, which is something we're getting very much behind. If there's nothing, if there's nothing done, arrest them all. Awesome, awesome, I like that. Um, very much in line with uh, supporting each other, that's good. Um, I don't think there's anyone really in the fourth group. Uh, 
anyone in the fourth group was there i think there was one or two people there was there any discussion that happened sorry anyone from the fourth group if not i'm just going to go towards the closing all right um so just to wrap this up before we wrap up the whole session this is a little exercise that i hope have opened your eyes a little bit um, because I want you to now ask yourself, this is not a question for everybody, um, but for you yourself to ask yourself is, do you think everything that we just did is better than the current situation? Or is it worse? Because a lot of times when we do actions, protests, campaigns, lobbying, we only think about things from our perspective, or sometimes we try to see our stakeholders, etc. But when it comes to the fight against the climate crisis and the climate emergency, it's not just one person or one group or one association doing one thing. Everyone is doing a lot of different things concurrently. And if these things don't always match up, sometimes there can be disasters, sometimes there can be no um, movement, sometimes things can just become stagnant, um, which like the Paris Agreement kind of has become over the past five to seven years, the stagnation since the Paris Agreement was formed is um, not a healthy thing for us in uh, civil society and for the world in general. So the reason, I mean, this exercise is usually done an hour long in person and like people can run between groups and negotiate, etc. But I just wanted to give you guys this little experience to know that sometimes what you're doing is not necessarily right. It's not necessarily wrong. Um, but do look at the bigger picture. There's more to things that are going on than what you are just doing there. And sometimes you can link your work with other actions, other groups, um, with other movements as well. And don't always look down on yourselves. Um, this is also just a last thing to say that um, sometimes we have a saying in Malaysia, sikit sikit, lama lama jadi bukit, um, small, uh, small grains of sand over a long period of time can become a mountain. Um, so do continue the work that you're doing. Actions and uh, protests and campaigns are really important uh, work that you um, need to do um, to get your voices out there, to get what uh, the people want to be heard, heard. And um, yeah, that's all for my little session. Uh, Danny, I pass it back to you to wrap up uh, for today. I hope you all had fun. If you have any questions about the River role play. Um, do drop me a message and maybe I can tell you guys a little bit more or organize a separate session for your uh, a bit more longer and extensive. Um, thanks, everyone. Yes, it is, uh, it is always difficult when there is limited time and so many ideas. Um, yeah, thank you everybody very much for, for coming to our session and for listening to the work, what we do and taking part in the role, River Role Play game. Um, Yes, um, I hope that we managed to inspire you with the projects which we which we showed you as a few examples. And as a, as COP is coming up again, we know that everybody is starting to organize a lot of different kind of mobilizations and uh, different kind of actions. Um, if there's any way that we can support you, please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, you can either do that through finding our contact on our website at artivistnetwork.org or just uh, write an email to yes, I'm gonna just put it in the in the chat. Contact at artivistnetwork.org. We're really happy to support you with uh, any skills or any kind of input which you need. So yeah, thank you very much, and I hope you have a nice rest of the day, um, depending on which part of the day you are in at the moment in the world. Um, and I will pass it back to Lise. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Danny and Amelen. Uh, it's always a pleasure to do trainings and sessions and work with you too. Uh, and thank you, Johnson, for helping with the tech today. Thanks to the interpretation uh, interpreters for uh, helping us make this session more accessible. Uh, and amazing, huge thank you to everyone who attended today. Um, if you have any questions about uh, the training or any of the other trainings from this week, the session, anything, uh, you can email me uh, here. I've just pasted my email in the chat box. Uh, as I said, this is the first session of uh, quite a, a big program that we're running this week. You can see uh, the other 
sessions on the website. I'm going to paste that in the chat box as well. Um, and as I said as well earlier, we have an evaluation form for you to fill in to give us a bit of feedback on what you thought of this session of the trainings in general, uh, as well as uh, this is a way you can ask for a certificate for uh, attending se this session. So uh, do have a look in there as well. Uh, and yeah, just uh, hope to see you all on some of the other sessions uh, or other spaces. And thanks again for attending. And um, thank you to Amalyn and Danny again for, for running this session for us. And have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.